Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue in the book of Romans, chapter 12. I think we'll be finishing the chapter today. But before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are controlled by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we have the opportunity, the privilege to study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds will be open to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 12. Now, we've been studying some writing that Paul wrote in the epistle to the Romans. And the subject has been love. This started back in verse 9. He began the topic of love. Love first towards our brothers and sisters in Christ, also towards the unbeliever, and also towards those who persecute us. He kind of jumps around between these different groups. Let's begin by going back to verse 9 and reading up to where we've been at this point. Romans 12:9. Love must be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. And brotherly love be devoted to one another. Take the lead in honoring another. Not lacking in enthusiasm, fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted in prayer. Sharing with the needs of the saints practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Think the same toward one another, not thinking too highly of yourself, but accommodating the lowly. Do not be wise in your own thinking. So we see here Paul jump from sort of thought to thought with a whole string of things that we as Christians can begin to apply practically in our lives, both in how we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ, even those who may persecute us, and how with other brothers and sisters we're to be thinking these same things. Now in verse 17, Paul again, addresses how we should love the unbeliever, even those who use evil. Romans twelve seventeen. Never paying back evil for evil, be thoughtful about what is right before all men. As Christians, we do not do evil. We have learned about evil. It's a sin, a sin that hurts others. It maliciously and is it is malicious and is injurious towards others. In other words, it's out to hurt people. It may be with words or deeds. We're not even supposed to be thinking evil. Certainly not exchanging insults for insults. But let's look at these lines here. Never paying back evil for evil. That tells us what we're not to do. We are never to retaliate with evil towards those who have treated us that way. The second line tells us what we are to, are to do. Be thoughtful about what is right before all men. To be thoughtful means that we give some careful thought to it. What do we give careful thought to? We consider what would be the right thing to do. Even unbelievers can see when you treat evil people good. And they can see that as something that's different than what, that, than that what they may have done if someone had treated them evil, you see. So we're to give some thought in how to respond to people who treat us with evil. We're not supposed to just react and, and, and throw an insult back or, or do what they do to us in some other worse way or 
especially not try to outdo them. This is basically saying, be thoughtful about what is right before all men. Doing right things. Even unbelievers, we see them as right. Now, they don't set the standard, but God does. Remember, our standard is to do the good and well-pleasing, perfect will of God. Something that we've learned as our minds have been transformed by the word of God. So, when someone treats you with evil, think about how you're going to respond to them. Do something that's right and honorable. Listen to a couple other verses in the New Testament in this area. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. That's from Colossians 4.5. 1 Timothy 3.7 He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and to the devil's trap. Now this is Paul's teaching to a church leader. He must have a good reputation. You know, if he's a crook, we certainly don't want him as a church leader. And if the people outside the church see him as a conniving, sneaky uh, businessman, and there he is standing in that church trying to teach the Word of God, you can see where they'd have problems with that. So, we ask ourselves, what would be a thoughtful, a good thing to do when someone treats us with evil? First, we don't retaliate, and then we do some positive action. Something good, even that the unbeliever would see as something good. Now, let me make this clear. We're not talking about a criminal or someone who's out to physically hurt you or steal your property or hurt someone you love. We're talking about something on a personal level. Again, when someone treats you bad by insulting you, not a criminal, because then you might need to call the police, you see. So let's make sure we sort this out. This might be another kid on the playground who's just picking on you and making fun of you and maybe bullying you, and you're going to say the right thing to them. You see, you're not going to bully back and you're not going to strike back, but you're going to respond with something you've thought about, and it needs to be good. All right, verse 18, an important verse. If possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. A very important beginning to this verse, if possible. That means there's going to be times when it's not possible. There are times when keeping the peace between you and someone else is not possible because... They've gone too far. Maybe they've threatened you in a horrible way and you need to report them. Or if it's bad enough, you even tell your parents or the police. And the next line also is important. As far as it depends on you. If it depends upon you to keep the peace, then you keep the peace. That's what this is saying. If we're the ones to take it up to the next level of intensity and making somebody even more angry, don't do it. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with walking away from someone who wants to insult you or insult people you're with. And they may even hurl insults you as you walk away. Well, they should consider themselves fortunate because if you got in a conflict with them, then things might get worse and worse and worse for both of you. But when you walk away, you just give a short prayer for them, that God might bless them. They might see their need for Jesus. Okay? Now, some of these, of course, are judgment calls. 
if you see a, a kid somewhere or someone else doing something that's damaging property or really hurting somebody, then you need to turn them in. But they come up to you and just call you a goody two-shoes or some other name, so what? You know, I always go back to that line, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Don't let those names hurt you. In fact, sometimes when bad people say those things, that's kind of a compliment. Because they see the good in you, and they don't like it. All right? Verse 19. Here's an important verse. Here's where the Lord gets into it. Romans 12, 19. Do not take your own revenge, beloved, but give place for God's wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now this principle of God doing the revenge or the vengeance is sprinkled throughout the scripture. By that I mean it's in different portions of the scripture. It's in the Proverbs, it's in the Psalms, it's in Deuteronomy. We'll see it in Deuteronomy in a moment. It's in Matthew. I can give you some of those scriptures. Psalm 94.1, Proverbs 20.22, Matthew 5.39, Hebrews 10.30, First Thessalonians 4.6. See? There's lots of places. Let's go back and look at the one in Deuteronomy. This is probably where Paul got this quote. Now, let me talk to you about the book of Deuteronomy. Remember, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the second giving of the law. In other words, they got a good portion of the law teaching again, the Mosaic law. And that was the law they were to live under in the Old Testament. So they lived in the Old Testament under a different system than we do. We live under the New Testament, the New Covenant. That's what Testament means. Now, back under the Old Testament, though, there are still some principles that carry over into the New Testament. And this is one of them. This is a teaching that God passed on to the people of Israel through Moses. Now, this quote is from a song of Moses. In those days, they didn't have many books. They didn't have much writing material, or, and uh, they just didn't have books. Let's put it that way. It was too rare. So people would often remember things and then pass them on by memory. Can you imagine doing that today, remembering maybe two or three pages of a book? Well, this is a pretty long song, and it is very instructional. It teaches the people of Israel some things about God and some things that Moses wants them to know. Now, Moses is going to talk about the enemies of Israel and how God would sometime use those enemies of Israel to punish Israel. But listen to what he says in Deuteronomy 32, 35. This is if the Lord is speaking. It is mine to avenge. I will repay. In due time their foot will slip. Their day of disaster is near, and their doom rushes up on them. Now, sometimes God used evil nations like Assyria to punish Israel. But then, after their punishment is done, it was time for Assyria to get punished. So, Moses is telling the people, and it's a good thing to learn, God will pay back those who hurt you. Now, Paul takes this principle from the Old Testament of how God punished 
evil nations and applies it in a personal way for the Roman Christians and for us. Now let me say this. This is a very important principle to remember and apply. If you are really wronged by someone, a neighbor, a classmate, someone who really treats you wrong or unfair, maybe they're mean to you, maybe it's another Christian, whoever it is, you put the revenge in God's hands. You don't retaliate. You don't go back to hurt them. Let me ask you, who knows best on how to deal with people? God does, of course. His judgments are right. And He knows how to really punish. He knows the perfect punishment. And we can't even begin to get close to perfect punishment. We don't know all the facts. We can't give out the punishment. God can, though. The idea here of giving place to God. Remember our verse. Let's go back and look at our verse. Do not take your own revenge, beloved, but give place. That means give God the opportunity. Give Him the chance. Give Him some time. Don't get in God's way. You know what happens if you get in somebody's way when someone's trying to spank someone? You jump in front of them, you may get the spanking, you see? You don't want to do that. Give God place for His wrath. Let Him deal with them. And He will. The idea of giving place for God's wrath means you give it over to Him. Leave it in His hands. Now, when it comes to revenge, if someone's really hurt you, they've insulted you, they've treated you with evil, you let God take care of it. Now, right there on the spot, we've already learned of some things you can do. You can pray for them. You can bless them. You can do something good towards them. But it just depends on the circumstances. They may just hit and run, you know. Not much you can do about that. But if they're standing there and they're throwing insults at you, if you can think of a good word to say, do it. If not, just be quiet and walk away. Sometimes walking away is the most wonderful testimony because it tells that person that you're not getting angry and you're not going to retaliate. Maybe they think you're some sort of coward. Well, first of all, who really cares what they think? Because if they're thinking evil, that's what they're going to think. But if you show them some good, that might just throw them for a loop. They won't know what to do. Listen to verse 20. This would be even more surprising to an enemy. Romans 12, 20. Rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing this, you will be heaping burning coals on his head. Now what's this all about, heaping burning coals on his head? Well, this is kind of interesting. First thing we want to do is go back where this is taught in the Old Testament. So we go back to Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs 25, verse 21 and 22. Listen to this. Now you know Proverbs, right? Have you ever studied any Proverbs with me? This is the book of wisdom. And the biggest line in there, the most important line, is that wisdom is beginning to fear the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom. You learn to revere God. Proverbs 25, 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, 
give him water to drink. And doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Then look at this last line that Paul didn't even include this. And the Lord will reward you. Now, let's go through this a little bit. First of all, remember, this is on a personal level. This isn't uh, an invading army. It isn't a criminal. It's not someone who is out to steal or burn down your house or something like that. But it's someone, like I said, like a neighbor or maybe someone in a school or a club or someone you like to play, somewhere you like to play. Whoever it is, it's someone who's out to get you for one reason or another. This says if they are hunger, hungry or thirsty. That's basic needs. Maybe they're angry because they have nothing to eat and they see that you do. Or maybe they're thirsty. They don't drink, get to drink a soda pop or a Coke because their parents can't afford it. So they're jealous. And the way they take out their jealousy is to be insulting and angry towards people. Well, if you know they're hungry or thirsty, offer them something to eat or drink. You know, this could be just a simple step in giving them some peace around you. You'd be acting kind of like a peacemaker. You see? But then we see this line, and just like Paul has it, you'd be heaping burning coals on his head. Now, if you go back and you read some of the things in the ancient world or what this might refer to, if you go back and read some of the writings that's in the ancient world, you might have a difficult time figuring out what this is. But here's one of the closest things that I know of. That in Egypt, now remember Israel had spent a lot of time in Egypt, and they haven't been out too, far, too long now. It's only been about 40 years. But in those days, Egypt, in Egypt, they had this ritual. And they would put hot coals in some sort of plate and put it on their heads, kind of burn on top of your head a little bit. You could feel the heat. And that was a way of self-punishment. Now, I think it sounds kind of silly, but it was a way that they thought if they could hurt themselves, then the gods would be pleased because, you see, if they had sinned before their gods, and I say gods with an S because they believed in many gods, which aren't really gods, but that's what they believed. If you ever watched any of those movies, those, uh, you know, like The Mummy or something like that, these people believed in all kinds of strange gods. And that's true, they did. Well, if you put this coal and burned your head a little bit, that was like saying to the God that you're sorry. And they were supposed to give you some sort of forgiveness. Well, as silly as that sounds, Paul takes it and uses it here. Because what it does, it makes a person think about what he's done. And that's what we want to get out of it. We want them to think about what they've done. When you do something good to somebody and they expect something bad because they treated you bad, that's like them getting some hot coals on their head and saying, why did I do that? I shouldn't have done that. He's not treating me evil. In fact, he's treating me nice. He just offered me a Coke or offered me a snack or ask his parents to take some groceries over to my family. You see? Whatever the reason that they said that they were your enemy and they act like that, he begins to realize that he's wrong about you and that there are people that can love him and show some love for him. Now, let me just say this, because this is also true. Sometimes when you do something like this for somebody, 
they'll resent it. They'll say, oh, you feel sorry for me. Well, you don't need to feel sorry for me. You're not feeling sorry for them. You're just helping them. You see? So they may even get harder towards you. Maybe take more revenge or insult you again. I don't want your money. I don't want your help. But you do the right thing. And if they act that way, you can't control that either, can you? Well, you may just have to eventually walk away from them. But you don't show any hatred. You show some compassion and some love and leave the results in the Lord's hands. You know, it may be the first time in a long time that they have had someone actually show some love towards them. Have you ever been around people who really don't like Christmas? I'm not talking about people who just don't think Christmas is necessary because we don't we're not really directed to celebrate the birth of Christ in Scripture. But at the same time, most people are in a pretty good mood. People are up and happy and the seasons are a season is current cooler, especially down here in Texas where we need the cool weather now and then. But even then, some of those people, when they realize that people actually show some compassion to them, especially during Christmas season, it picks them up. It's an opportunity to show them love. Now, like I said, they may not like it, like people don't like Christmas, but you do the right thing anyway. All right? Now, verse 21. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil. Let me start over. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word for overcome here is the Greek word for conquer or be victorious. You ever seen the shoe or the sporting good company, Nike? That's the Greek word for victory. The word for overcome here, we put it, I'll write it in the Greek first, nikao. We translate it nikao, like that. If you just shout out the word, you know, this is the verb. If you just shout out the word for victory, you come up with nike, nike. You see? Well, This tells us to do not be conquered by evil. Don't let evil have victory over you. Don't let someone's malicious acts or horrible words defeat you. Don't let it get to you. Don't let it make you react in anger or fear or cause you to sin, or cause you to do evil. All right? Now, that's an important principle. Do not be overcome by evil. Don't let or allow someone's vicious attacks, whether they're with their tongue verbally, or they're bullies, whatever tactics they use to defeat you. And when I say bully, I don't mean someone who physically pushes you around. Maybe it's a boss. Maybe it's a supervisor. Maybe it's a co-worker. Maybe it's someone who you just know and they want to push their way around. And they push people out of their way. They like to run over people. Don't let that corrupt you. Don't act that way back towards them. Now there are appropriate measures to be taken. But what we want to do is be good. Oh, you want to cut in line? Well, there are other people behind you. 
Have you asked them? Now you're asking for a conflict, or they might actually think about what they're doing. So what's a judgment call? Are they adults? Are they older? Are they just a young bunch of teenagers trying to cause problems, you see? Think about the situation, but don't let evil defeat you. Show some kindness. Show some respect. Now, I have a tendency, since I'm older and been a parent a long time, if I have see some young kid acting smart and trying to be evil, I'll sometimes go in there and protect the older person or the younger person or someone who doesn't defend themselves. Now, that's appropriate action, too. That's actually a good thing. And, you know, most people would see that as right. And remember, that's what we want to do. But what Paul is doing is to us here is to tell us, don't let evil defeat you. Don't let it corrupt you so you retaliate at their level. Don't play that game with them. Do something completely different. Maybe you can show some kindness, some respect, even some good towards them. Now remember this. Do not be overcome with evil. If they're unbelievers, now you've learned this in Romans, right? This is one reason we're ready to hear this. You've learned these principles. What's the problem with the unbeliever? What's the problem with these who want to do evil? Let me ask you this. What realm do they live in? Remember the realms? The unbeliever lives in the realm of sin and death. So what's he controlled by? The sin nature. This rules his life. Sometimes they can't do anything but bad stuff. You know, an unbeliever, his goals in life are so different than that of a Christian. He wants to be somebody. He wants to make money. He wants to have really nice things. He wants to go in debt and have really nice cars and houses and nice clothes and stuff like that, and you're just living your life simply, doing your job, growing in the Word, and being a witness. So the value system is very different with an unbeliever. He thinks people are out to get him. He thinks people are out to cheat him somehow. That he's not getting his part. That's especially true in the United States right now. There's a lot of people who want a piece of the pie. By that I mean they want a piece of the government. And the problem is, that's not the way government's supposed to work. People are supposed to work for a living. Earn their own living. But some things have gotten so out of hand now, at least in the United States, that it's hard to make a living and also have health care and pay for your food even if you have a decent little job. Well, that's another story. But what I want you to remember is that the unbeliever who does evil, he is controlled by the sin nature. And sometimes all he has is just himself and being mean towards people. That's the only way he thinks he can get ahead in life, is to treat people evilly. Now, whatever shape or form, whether it be one person or a group, or maybe if it's an evil organization, there are evil organizations. If they treat you with evil, just avoid it. Don't get involved. Sometimes they'll attack you, and you have to just make the right decision, but don't you turn back to them with evil you do good and maybe the good thing is to walk away just protect your loved ones or yourself 
But there are times you can say things and treat them with respect. And no one has treated them with respect before. Say yes sir or yes ma'am, whatever. Well, we overcome evil by doing good. By using truth. What's one way you can do good to an unbeliever? We've already seen that if they hunger, give them some food. If they thirst, give them a drink. But if you can and you have the opportunity, speak to them about God. If they have a hunger to know about God, speak to them about Christ. One time I asked somebody who was kind of bullying me around. He was actually a supervisor. And I said, what are you going to do after retirement? Well, I don't know what it's nothing to do with what's going on here. And I go, no, I mean after retirement. And my thinking was after you're dead and gone. Because see, a lot of people look forward to that retirement. So now they're 60 or near 70 years old and they're retired and their health is going down and they're barely maybe making it financially or not making it financially. What about 10 years from now? Do you have a relationship with the Lord? What about eternity? But most people, especially those in evil, don't think about that. They've already denied God, denied that there's any punishment after death in many cases. They don't believe there's a heaven or a hell. Many of them don't. So they're just going to get out of life what they can right now. We don't think that way, do we? Remember, their control was sin nature. What are we controlled by? The Holy Spirit. And He gives us all we need to do good, even to evil people. We have the power, we have the truth. And the Bible teaches, greater is He who is in us than he who is in the world. And that refers to the devil and his people. Listen to 1 John 4.4. 4. I'm going to put it on the bottom of the board here. John writes, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Don't ever forget that. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the fellowship of the Father and the Son. And you have the power to overcome evil with good. Well, that ends chapter 12. And because we have some time left, I want us to go over some of the main principles. So this is kind of a Review and quiz, you might say, okay? But I'm not going to grade your papers, but I want you to mentally check yourself to see if you remember these things, okay? Let's put some of the final principles on the board, and we're going to read through them. See if you can remember these things. One. This chapter began by teaching us that as Christians, we are to take our Christian life up to level two. Two. Level two is offering ourselves completely over to God as living sacrifices. This is our reasonable service, our spiritual worship. Three. At level two, the believer goes to the process of transformation. This transformation takes place by the renewing of the mind. Four, renewing of the mind comes to the learning and believing God, uh, Bible truth so that the believer learns what God's good and perfect will is. This is proved out in his life as he does God's will. Five. 
every believer is to view himself as united to the many-membered body of Christ. Do you remember that? We are all members of the body of Christ. Six, all members do not have the same function in the body. Seven, all believers are individually members one of another. This is the mutuality of the body of Christ. Eight, every believer is to use his gift or gifts within the body of Christ according to his proportion of faith. Well, that brought us up to the point where we started learning about love. Now let's go over some points on love toward the brethren. These are short points. Love towards other believers. One, the love of the believer should be genuine, real. Two, evil should be vigorously avoided. Remember, abhor evil. Three, believers are to be devoted in their love to other brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, let me emphasize that. If you have brothers and sisters in Christ around you, I'm not talking about the ones that live at home with you and they have the same parents you do, but we're talking about men and women and boys and girls, old and young. If they are Christians, you love them. Four, believers are to maintain their enthusiasm in the faith. Remain fervent in the Holy Spirit, serving the Lord. Okay? <clears throat> I wanted to uh, make one small correction there, and I'll get right back on this. Okay? Five, we keep rejoicing in the hope we have in Christ and our wonderful eternal future. You know, sometimes I get tired of, well, it may be my job or I'm just tired. And I start thinking about the future. And that one of these days it's going to be over and I'll be at the Lord and this will be over with. And you know... Of course, the future doesn't even compare to the worst stuff we go through now. And that can pick me up. I say, okay, let's just get it over with, you see. Six, we persevere in our trials and devote ourselves to prayer by maintaining a strong prayer life. Seven, we share with the needs of saints. Eight, we practice hospitality toward all. Now this overlaps, of course, to the unbeliever also. But don't forget to share with the needs of the saints and also practice hospitality. All right, now let's look at love toward the unbeliever. We had some scriptures on that. I sorted them out for us. Love towards the unbeliever. There's not as many as those here. One, we never pay back evil for evil. That's not something Christians do because we do not work with evil. Right? Two, we strive to be at peace with everyone as long as it is possible and depends on us. We should be peacemakers. And when it depends upon us, 
That's what we do. Three, we leave all revenge in the care of God. God is the great avenger. He is the one who will deal with people who hurt us, even criminals who don't get caught. They will be dealt with. Four, we love and bless our enemy. Five, we do not let evil conquer us, but we conquer evil by doing good. Now, let me just say a few more things about what we've done here in Romans. We spent perhaps now several weeks, maybe a few months, studying the first 11 chapters of Romans. I hope you've gotten this far. If you hear this, I suppose you have. And you've went in sequence. You've went lesson to lesson. And you've built up a knowledge of truth. That's the way to do it. You don't want any gaps because that's where you get mistakes and that's where you get an error. So you want to make sure you study the whole thing. And after, what is this, some 60-something lessons now, we come to the point of where we're summing up some of the principles we put into practice. Now, you can't do this without living in the power of the Spirit. You do this because you know Jesus Christ. You know you're justified by faith. You know you offer yourself over to God, the members of your body. Remember that? And you know the world is evil. It's run by the devil. God allows him to do this. God allows him to give us trials and tribulations. And we've learned those things so much we've learned in just the book of Romans. And now we're putting it into practice. How to deal with evil people. How to love the brethren. You see? How to go to level two. And if you are on level two, you're going to be renewing your mind and practicing these things. Let me tell you this. You're growing. You're maturing. And you keep this up, you're going to be a mature believer and glorifying God, and he will have great reward for you in heaven. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this marvelous word from you. We ask that you'll challenge us with it. And they will live it out in our lives in the power of the Spirit. Help us understand, especially some of the difficult things regarding evil and evil people and how to deal with them. Then give us the power to apply it when you give us the opportunity. And don't let us miss that opportunity. We thank you and ask you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.